The airy winds of change will blow fiercely in 2024. Make no mistake, great transitions are on the way. The first half of this decade and the second half of this decade honestly seem like two completely different worlds. 2024 will be a landmark year in the transition into the age of air, a period of history characterized by the rapid flow of information, dynamism, and the influence of the technology that facilitates it. And so the air element which is the land of ideas, thoughts, technology, being attuned to the mental plane, major theme of 2024's astrology. We see with the new technologies coming online with our media, what is real, what is not real, these blurred lines between fiction and reality, between truth and deception, especially in the realms of AI, as you see things like deep fakes or fake news or totally created films. So you have the intersection of a digitally dominated society with those dystopic surveillance regimes, the burgeoning data-driven technocracies that are arriving all over the world. They include things like central bank digital currencies, digital IDs, social media regulation and censorship. These things all contribute to a very profound shift into this new age of air that we are being born into. The way I see 2024 as a whole is it's sort of the last year before the great crossover of the mid 2020s. It's the last year we'll have Saturn and Neptune holy in Pisces. It's the last year we'll have Uranus holy in Taurus. It's the last year we'll have Pluto dancing back and forth between Capricorn and Aquarius. So in this sense, 2024 might be considered a kind of long goodbye or going into a final meeting with planets knowing that they're going to be gone and those energies will soon be gone by 2026. Knowing that we are where we are, how can we begin to lean into the energy of transition in 2024? Be prepared for an intensifying conflict between the forces of centralization and decentralization. And the centrality of human intelligence itself will be challenged too. We may have to reckon with the reality of non-human intelligences, whether animal, digital, or something else entirely. So welcome to this forecast of what promises to be a landmark year. And it will begin very early on with a sign change of truly historic importance. On January the 21st, Pluto moves into the sign of Aquarius, Saturn's forward-looking air sign. Pluto will spend most of 2024 in that sign, although it will make one last return to Capricorn in the autumn of the year that we'll discuss later on. It's unique here in 2024 because you get the power of these ingresses not once but twice. In astrology, ingresses are often very loud particularly with an outer planet or dwarf planet like Pluto, which is so profound. This will be Pluto's second foray into Aquarius. It dipped its toes into that sign between March the 23rd and June the 11th of this year, giving us a preview of what it's likely to bring next year. SJ and I made a video specifically reviewing that period from a mundane astrological perspective. We identified several of the themes that came up. Those are the themes that will explode into our realities in 2024, so do watch that video if you haven't seen it before. 2023 was the initial preview into the future, right? The movie trailer for Pluto and Aquarius dropped in the spring, and then we had to sort of return to the old paradigm for the rest of the year. Now it's almost the reverse where we're arriving to the feature length film, but there's going to be some sort of finale or resolution for the old story woven into the sequel. What is Pluto? It's an engine of change. So at first, what's an unassuming force will then take over something we maybe all ignored then emerges to take over all of reality, changing everything. You know, Pluto and Aquarius dismantled the once central belief that a king has divine right and replaced that with the universal acknowledgement of inherent human rights. This is the 18th century version of Pluto and Aquarius' transit. So it's just an example of what Pluto and Aquarius can do. We've talked about it at length, but that's my favorite example where you have an order of reality, something that everyone assumes is true, like the king having this divine right of rule, and then slowly this notion that actually the king doesn't have anything more than you or me or any other being, that there's these inalienable rights, that begins to percolate and then takes over the whole world and we have whole new governments founded upon that single idea. Aquarius is the sign of the outsider and during Pluto and Aquarius transits of the past, civilizations had their worldviews and even ways of life shattered as they came face to face with powerful outsiders. What could that mean in 2024? 
when we assume the civilizations of the world are all well aware of each other. Well, expect the theme of encounters with non-human intelligences to become prominent. That includes AI. And AI might even give us insights into the intelligences of the animal kingdom. It's already making great strides in understanding the languages of animals like whales. And I think the year will include revelations about even more unusual forms of non-human intelligences. Yes, expect the theme of UFOs, what governments know about them, to be in the news in important ways this year. Every Pluto era has its monster, so to speak. In Capricorn, the monster was the oligarch. It was the too-big-to-fail corporation. It was the war machine. It was the empire. In Aquarius, the monster is probably going to be the panopticon or the terminator. It's the threat of the surveillance state, right? It's um, the growing dread around technology. It's this creeping sense that we've Frankenstein, this artificial intelligence into creation, and now it's taken on a life of its own and it's too late to put it back in the box. AI looks set to be pretty disruptive to the economy, particularly for those who do creative and intellectual work. It may facilitate the work of some, but force others to start to retool and retrain. It was actually in that brief window last spring when we had Pluto and Aquarius for just two months that uh, Jeffrey Hinton, the so-called godfather of AI, retired from his job at Google and he expressed some concern even some regret around the growing threat that AI poses to humanity. Another thing that he stressed was the importance of investing in AI safety and control. And by doing so, he may have actually summarized what one of the main dominant struggles of the next two decades is going to be. Pluto entered Capricorn in 2008, so this year we're bringing an era of history to an end. That period began with the subprime mortgage crisis. And over the course of that transit, Pluto highlighted uncomfortable truths about large institutions and power. And in the West, we saw a great transformation in the professed ideology of the institutions of power. By the way, this doesn't mean that the monsters of the previous era simply go away or stop being a problem. We're just moving our shovels to a new excavation site. The territory where the monster lives is sort of where we go beneath the layers and see what's all the way beneath the surface level presentation of the problem. When you dig deep enough, your shovel can hit skeletons and it can hit buried treasure. With a Pluto process, there's always an element of exposing the rot, but also also mining that substrate for wealth. I feel like 2024 specifically with the way that we're still threading that needle between the Capricorn and the Aquarius era might present these questions of who gets to benefit from these dramatic advances in technology. This will be a landmark year in our transition into the Age of Air, a subject I covered in this video. During the last Age of Air between 1186 and 1425, we saw the rise of the Inquisition, an attempt by the central power of Europe at that time, the Catholic Church, to control what people were allowed to say and believe about the world. At the same time, it was also the time of the rise of the first universities in Europe. And so it saw a wave of democratization of information. That is one of the core conflicts at the heart of our times and expect it to be a major theme of next year. Secreted within the vast oceans of data that have flooded the world in the past decades are truths that our human minds haven't been able to discern because we can't process that much data. But AI can peer into this data and extract useful information it can potentially extract the truth. And the truth of things is not always convenient to power. And so the question of who controls this technology and what access we all get to it will become vital. And remember, you know, one of the things that got exposed with Pluto and Capricorn with the way that that era kicked off with the worldwide recession was the way so much of the world's wealth is hoarded at the very top. I do wonder if eventually, you know, over the course of 20 years of Pluto and Aquarius, we might see this push to have the technological and the scientific advancements benefit the masses. That is definitely one of the more hopeful potential outcomes of Pluto and Aquarius, you know, with the way that it sort of symbolizes the decentralization of power and the dispersal of resource to the margins. But I could see 2024 being defined by that initial power struggle, right? Where we're at the brink of this brave new world, you know, for better or for worse. And we see a lot of the usual suspects trying to capitalize on this progress at the expense of everyone else. The question of centralization versus decentralization has never been more important. Now, Pluto and Aquarius is fertile ground for social activism, labor revolutions, 
decentralized initiatives. Aquarius being an air sign also brings the empowering role of technology into the mix. And so innovations like Bitcoin, I think, will take center stage in 2024 because it's a decentralized, communal, value-driven proposition. So, you know, you can expect things like the evolution of social contracts, particularly as artificial intelligence ascends and new forms of currency emerge. You know, the old ways don't really work when in real time you can connect to anybody anywhere or send money to anybody anywhere. So we're coming into the world envisioned by something like the Jetsons or Gattaca more than ever, especially during an age of air. So we'll see things like innovations in travel or flying cars, that would be the Jetsons, or biotech and how we'll be able to analyze our blood or our genetics in ways that we can never have foreseen. Pluto and Aquarius will bring that to us. It's the nature of Pluto. The unknown becomes the dominating feature and it revolutionizes society. The sign of Aquarius opposes Leo, the sign of the sun and thus the sign of the center. Pluto in Aquarius historically has to do with the creation or revelation of new centers. I think also as Pluto transits through Aquarius, geopolitics will continue to shift dramatically. It's noteworthy that Russia's declaration of state sovereignty chart, that root chart for Russia, the United States Sibley chart, and Mao's announcement of the People's Republic of China chart, all three of those share an Aquarius moon. That's a lot of the people of the world. Those significant implications for the masses of people in those countries as the moon signifies the people right there in Aquarius. Pluto's gonna come transform the relationship between those masses of people and their governments. Last time Pluto was in Aquarius, we saw a lot of news about the expansion of the BRICS block, which is welcoming in a lot of new members across the global south. It seems like it may be pushing to alter the balance of global power, particularly in the economic realm. That's likely to accelerate in 2024. As organizations like BRICS rise, we might observe a decentralization of global influence or more shared power dynamics accompanied by the emergence of new monetary systems, new digital control grids. They're already talking about digital IDs in Europe and elsewhere and new digitized forms of national currency that will then be interlinked in communal currency regimes, things like the BRICS coming up with a currency. So international relations are set to be transformed and it's a more polycentric world order, digitized and computer mediated, all of the nature of the Aquarian. But as an individual, I'd recommend thinking about the time that Pluto spent in Aquarius in 2023, again, between March the 23rd and June the 11th. Pluto is the Lord of transformation. And Aquarius, if you use whole sign houses, as we do on this channel, represents a particular area of your life. That's the part of your life that's ripe for total transformation over the coming 20 year period. But you'll likely have received some subtle hints of change to come based on what happened during that period last year. And if things felt difficult, don't worry too much. Ask yourself how those difficulties were asking you to change and how they may have highlighted ways in which you weren't being true to yourself or to your path. All three of us are available for consultations to help you answer these questions if you need help. Pluto's entry into Aquarius alone already makes this a big year, but it also sees one of the most remarkable looking eclipses we've seen in many years. On March the 25th, we enter the first of the year's two eclipse seasons, with a lunar eclipse at five degrees of Libra. And that will be followed on April the 8th with a quite remarkable looking solar eclipse at 19 degrees of Aries. So out of all of the eclipse seasons that will include a Libra eclipse or an Aries eclipse, there's only one eclipse season that has eclipses both in Libra and Aries. And that is this first eclipse season of 2024. And so I think the whole story which began in April 2023 with the solar eclipse in Aries and will end with the solar eclipse in Aries in March 2025. This whole story of eclipses along the Libra-Aries axis peaks here in March and April 2024 when you have a solar eclipse in Aries and a lunar eclipse in Libra in the same eclipse season. So this pair I think is a little bit of a mixed bag because we get a Libra eclipse ruled by exalted Venus and Pisces, but Mars and Saturn are right there sneaking up behind Venus and by the time we get the Aries eclipse, Mars and Saturn are conjunct. And remember, you know, Mars is ruling that eclipse. So it's kind of like, yay, look how nice this feels now that I've let go of this thing or cleared this thing out of the way. 
followed immediately by a sense of like, oh crap, but that means I have to deal with like this new set of consequences too. And the second remarkable thing about this eclipse is that it's conjunct the asteroid Chiron, not just to the degree, but to the exact minute. In Greek myth, Chiron was a centaur, an immortal being who was pierced by a poisoned arrow, leaving him with a wound he could never heal. He was known for his wisdom and knowledge of medicine. And so Chiron represents the archetype of the wounded healer, one who uses their own wounds to help others. Experience counts in healing. So if you know a certain kind of pain that you yourself have been pulled through, even if those wounds are still raw or there are scars, there's a unique ability to help others and carry others through similar pain, and that's Chiron. And so in Aries, being a, that it's ruled by Mars, a planet of relationships, we may be looking at past relationships to teach us how to embrace passion or others in a more uplifting way. We might be examining past trauma. We might be recovering from that trauma and then teaching others or helping others also recover from similar experiences. I wonder if we may see the theme of medicine or healing highlighted here, potentially even having to do with the pandemic and things related to that topic. But this eclipse looks set to be crucial for the United States in particular. Here's the eclipse path, so you can see that it will be visible over Mexico and the eastern half of the United States. America, especially during these years of Pax Americana, has been at war every year. Whether there's smaller wars in other countries or bigger wars, America has a lot, I think, to check in with itself on in terms of the nature of warfare, how it's conducting war, America's role as the global uh, superpower in terms of the might, where there's bases everywhere, American military bases. Some of this eclipse in April to me feels like reviewing and analyzing and trying to understand the wounds that have been caused by deploying weapons and using weapons so much in the last 70 years or even before and really processing the nature of warfare and healing the wounds of war. That's my main theme here for this eclipse in April, examining and healing these wounds of war and telling the truth and coming to deeper understandings about the nature of humanity and selfhood as a result. Chiron was an Aries for the peace movements in the 1960s and 1970s that ended the Vietnam War. You know, soldiers were giving up their war medals People were uh, dodging the draft, so-called, because they didn't want to participate in war. So there's a major return to that here in 2024, and I think we will be seeing more protests around war and the empire's involvement in war as people want to sort of heal and move beyond the very challenging and difficult nature of warfare. Since the very earliest days of the development of astrology, solar eclipses have been seen as highlighting leaders and monarchs and can signify their fall because a solar eclipse is a moment where the light of the sun is temporarily obscured. This may be a moment in which we see the fall from grace or the demise or blotting out of solar figures, those who are truly sensual and visible to all. I do wonder if there's going to be some sort of turning point in the presidential race at this point, where maybe the assumed front runner falls behind and someone else becomes ascendant. Chiron often symbolizes medicine too, and this eclipse is happening pretty close to the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction happening in the Sibley sixth house. So I do think that the healthcare system could be implicated here in a pretty big way. And although this seems uh, a lot less pressing in a critical election year, um, the fifth house also represents sports and games. And when I think Chiron and Aries, I think of like the wounded athlete trope. You know, could there be some sort of major shift in one of the national sports organizations, right? Maybe one that's instigated by someone getting badly injured. The themes of universalism, migration, currency, and boundaries may also come up in important ways, given that the ruler Mars is conjunct Saturn in Pisces. The effects of eclipses can be felt anywhere in the world, particularly for those people and institutions with placements close to the eclipse degree. The United Nations has its ascendant at 20 Aries, so organizations within that system could be implicated, but this remarkable eclipse isn't even close to the only big astrological development happening in April. On April the 10th, the day after the Aries eclipse, Mars and Saturn will make an exact conjunction at 14 degrees of Pisces. The Mars-Saturn conjunction is very much baked into the Aries eclipse, but as a standalone event, it's also initiating us into a new two-year cycle of difficulty. This might be when the biggest challenges of the Saturn and Pisces era really come home and become extremely apparent. 
you know, with Mars and Saturn and Pisces, I think about the loss of identity against the backdrop of the changing landscapes of reality. All of the new technologies that are coming online, the major dynamism in the shifting geopolitical landscape. One core delineation of Pisces is creativity. And the tactics of the imagination are central here. Mars and Saturn help us find new action that is more foundational as we're in this period of change. These conjunctions happen roughly every two years. And at a mundane level, their two-year cycle tells stories of challenge, suffering, and woe. For example, the last conjunction happened in April 2022, and that cycle has timed important developments in the Ukraine war as it made its various aspects. And the one before that, beginning in March 2020, was what we could call the pandemic cycle. So April 2024, we'll see the beginning of a new story of challenge for the world. But what will it be about? Unfortunately, it's also happening during an eclipse. So that also ramps up the potential for its destructiveness. You know, think trouble at sea, flooding, water contamination, crises of faith, like what's true, what do we believe? And it may also have to do with Piscean themes that are getting louder and louder during Saturn's co-presence in Pisces with Neptune, including migration. And there's another story at work here. Around this time, Saturn and Pluto will be approaching their semi-square. This is the 45 degree aspect, which is a minor aspect. It's similar to a square less powerful but still significant. They'll perfect that aspect on May the 5th, 2024, and we'll be roughly speaking within orb in April and May. So this semi-square harkens back to the 2020 Saturn-Pluto conjunction, which is the one that heralded the coming of the pandemic and tensions between the US and China. So this Mars-Saturn conjunction may well trigger those themes. Now, as if a big eclipse, a Mars-Saturn conjunction, and a Saturn-Pluto semi-square weren't enough, April has another big surprise for the world. On April the 21st, we'll see a conjunction of Jupiter and Uranus in Taurus. These conjunctions only come around once every 14 years. This is an electric, revelatory combination of planets, one that's correlated with some remarkable moments in history. Jupiter and Uranus will be within 15 degrees of conjunction until July. So that revelatory vibe will be coloring the first half of the year. But of course, the closer to the conjunction we are, the higher probability there is of seeing actual events taking place. The Jupiter-Uranus conjunction in Taurus might be one of the events that I've been most looking forward to this entire decade. Um, I've been referring to Jupiter-Uranus as sort of the galaxy brain transit in the vein of the galaxy brain meme. It's the sudden up-leveling from a very dim and limited conceptualization to a much brighter, more expansive one. You know, I was looking at the world with 2D glasses, but now I'm seeing these dimensions to reality that I wasn't even awake to previously. You know, Jupiter is known for broad ideals. It's known for its ability to influence. And when it meets Uranus and Taurus, which can bring suddenness, Uranus can, I think we might be looking for these kinds of shifts, especially as they relate to materialism and physical manifestation. Are these conjunctions nasty or nice, I hear you asking? Well, honestly, they can go either way. The essence of Uranus is unpredictability. Sometimes it brings us flashes of insight and the breaking of chains. And at others, it flips the table and upends our assumptions or simply blows things up that we thought we could rely on. And so I think Uranus's uncontrolled and eccentric tendencies might collide here a little bit with Taurus's desire for the comfort of well-trodden pathways. Uranus has been in Taurus for a while now. We've already seen all of this, but it's when Jupiter and Uranus get so close that Jupiter can bring that sense of dramatic idealism or ample optimism and encourage Taurus and Uranus and Taurus to maybe look beyond the immediate and familiar. You think about a pathway, you can walk that same pathway every day and it's well-worn. I think Jupiter and Uranus may be about trying to find new pathways or discover new you know, ways of getting to the same result that can break us out of our comfort zone. I love this transit. I think it's going to open up for us some new ways forward into the decade that we haven't yet thought of. Some events that have come at these conjunctions include the French Revolution of 1789, the outbreak of World War I in 1914, the Apollo landings of 1969, and the incident in 1983, in which the world came scarily close to nuclear war, an event I discussed in this video. This particular Jupiter-Uranus conjunction is happening in the sign of Taurus, that most earthy, sensual, and material of signs, where Uranus has been shaking up things since 2018, 
doing weird, surprising things to currency, property, and climate. The thing about Jupiter and Uranus conjoining in fixed signs is it's been a marker of changing what was formerly stable in the reality. So 1914 and 1941, I think that tells us something about the history of how Uranus and Jupiter conjunctions can initiate changes in the stability of reality. We might see some of that here in 2024. The last conjunction in Taurus. So on 9 May 1941, during World War II, the German submarine U-1110 was captured by the British Royal Navy and on board was the Enigma cryptography machine, which allied cryptographers later used to break coded German messages. Very Uranian, right? You capture a ship and then there's some kind of flash that can change everything, can upgrade in a surprising fashion our ability to navigate reality. And so maybe there'll be some kind of turn or surprise in that way or a new discovery that can help propel us into the decade. Jupiter-Uranus conjunctions bring forth a lot of innovation and a lot of breakthroughs. In Cosmos and Psyche, Rick Tarnas refers to Jupiter-Uranus cycles as ones of creativity and expansion, of scientific breakthroughs and big cultural milestones and social and political awakenings. I think a Jupiter-Uranus conjunction in Taurus could be really major for art and music, for food, for some sort of contemporary sexual revolution, for the economy, for currency, um, anything plant-based, right? Anything with a sort of back to nature or back to the land ethos. At the last Jupiter-Uranus conjunction in Taurus in 1941, we saw the release of the movie Citizen Kane, Orson Welles' masterpiece, which redefined what was possible in the medium of cinema. He also noted that sometimes these major moments that were later recognized as these watershed moments, as like the birth of important movements and ideas, were not necessarily loud in their significance at the time. At the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction of 1983, we saw the adoption of the TCP-IP protocol, which allowed computer networks to communicate with each other and essentially gave birth to the internet. Needless to say, that ended up being a moment of supreme importance, but few people would have seen its significance at the time. And if we go back to the time Uranus and Jupiter met in Taurus, in the Uranus cycle before that, we reach the year 1858. At the time of that conjunction, Charles Darwin announced his theory of evolution by natural selection, an idea that revolutionized conceptions of human origins, as well as our bodies and the purpose of material existence. Taurus is the sign in which the moon, signifier of the body, is exalted. As with Darwin's discovery, we may well see breakthroughs and new insights into genetics, the body, and human origins. And given the wider context, perhaps these insights could be generated by AI. So it could be that in the first half of 2024, and especially as we get closer to April, that there are these major cultural advancements occurring and most of the world isn't really even awake to it. Uh, of course, you know, we're astrologers, so we can anticipate this to some extent. Now, as I mentioned, I think the UFO topic will be extremely prominent next year. And I wouldn't be too surprised to see extraordinary claims being made around this subject around this time of the conjunction. Whether these claims will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth is another question. And it may also signify explosive moments of revolt or rebellion in certain parts of the world. I'm particularly concerned about the Middle East region. Here's an astro map of the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction and you can see there's a line passing very close to the Gulf and the conjunction is directly hitting several charts including Israel, Iran, Syria, and there could be more. And for what it's worth, Uranus was at 21 degrees of Taurus when World War II broke out. So this is also the Uranus return of that conflict. But whatever happens in April, get ready to be surprised. In my opinion, it looks like the key month of the year, aside from November perhaps, but then comes some genuinely lovely astrology. In May, after Jupiter and Uranus conjoin, we'll see a sweet congregation of planets in Taurus, the sign of fecundity, material pleasure, and the harmonious rhythms of work and play. Taurus's ruler Venus enters the sign on April the 29th, and the good vibes are likely to build from there. In general, May looks like one of the nicest months of the year. So if there's a party or a celebration that you're planning, or you're maybe trying to think about when is a good time to take a trip, there's a lot of good vibes in May, and I would say early June too, to some extent. Taurus is known for its focus on materiality and the pleasures that can come from materiality, which is substantial. 
Uh, this period is also likely to see heightened focus on art, on decoration, fostering a climate of gentleness and friendliness. I'm excited about the cinema that may come out here in April, May. It's a time that becomes ripe for amicable connection, all of that Venusian stuff of bringing people together, indulging in all kinds of pursuits that relate to the flesh and the pleasure. Though this also all might bring a tendency toward extravagance and excess, which can feel good, right? And so we might want to balance here. Economic justice, major theme here as well. Jupiter and Taurus timed Occupy Wall Street in the past. And I think with Pluto and Aquarius here in May, we might use this fixed square Pluto and Aquarius and this pile up in Taurus to look for justice radical social reforms. The peak moment comes on May the 18th with a Jupiter Kazemi. Jupiter will be empowered in a conjunction with the Sun, but just a few degrees away are the other benefic planet Venus and Uranus. It seems like there's a lot of fecundity and sweetness being activated at this time, but maybe it's not going in the direction you assumed it was going to go, right? It's like the rose garden is in full bloom, and for some reason the roses are blue, and you're like, how did that happen? This expansive nature of Jupiter in the realm of Taurus transforms the material into one that seeks prosperity, and the key here is generosity. You know, we can be reminded here uh, to temper over optimism and self indulgence. One of the best ways to do that is to say, how can I give to people around me? So the message is simple. If you're planning on taking holidays this year, do it in May. Good times are pretty much assured. And if you know your chart, look to your Taurus whole sign house for the area of life particularly highlighted by these sweet yet surprising moments. And then there'll be a change of vibe towards the end of May when Jupiter completes its stay in Taurus and enters the curious, fast-talking realm of Gemini. On May the 26th, Jupiter completes its year-long transit through Taurus and enters the mercurial double-bodied sign of Gemini. When Jupiter enters Gemini is when we really start to feel like we're in a year of air in the age of air. And to me, it also represents the initial learning curve as we really get acquainted with the Pluto and Aquarius universe. Jupiter and Gemini is gonna bring a period of great intellectual stimulation because Gemini is curiosity and Jupiter adds this insatiability to our notions of curiosity, where we're eager, maybe more eager than ever, to absorb and experience all that's on offer in this reality in terms of the mind and the information sets. Jupiter and Gemini, I think, will urge connection with something greater than oneself, the kind of spiritual nature of Jupiter, but we're doing it through the realm of thought and language and books and writing and conversation and discussions, pushing the boundaries of the mental facilities. The Gemini influence, I think, ushers in a multifaceted approach to growth as well, which will encourage a sampling of diverse philosophies, cultures, ideas. There's going to be a lot on the table, and I think it may be hard at times to juggle everything that's going to be placed before us. With Jupiter and Gemini, the phrase, too much information, comes to mind. And I think that's a strong candidate as one of the defining epithets of this year. Gemini is considered a sign of detriment for Jupiter. Really, either of the Mercury signs are because Jupiter is big picture and Mercury is fine print. So when you get Jupiter in a Mercury ruled sign, sometimes you can get mired in this effect where we're missing the forest for the trees or we're drowning in so much information that we can't really analyze or make sense of it. It's sort of the energy of someone who's trying to tell you a story, but they lose the plot because they always get fixated on the details. Jupiter in detriment can entail a sense of meaningless avalanches of words and information, over-promising, and even deceit. So there's this, you know, there can be a lack of depth sometimes here, a lack of follow-through, too many promises, puffery, as they say in the legal world. So one thing that immediately comes to mind for me here is the issue of media literacy. and how much more uh, important that's going to be in the era of Pluto and Aquarius, where we're going to be inundated in these deep fakes and AI generated video. So Jupiter will be training Pluto while it's in Gemini. And also keep in mind that the first few years of Pluto and Aquarius will feature Pluto in the term of Mercury. So a lot of these tech issues, these media issues are going to be more front and center this decade. It's a learning curve, right? So what do we do with the chaos of information? California recently became the fourth state to require media literacy training for students. And I think that this is going to be sort of the wave. So the fast moving airiness of the times will be very much in evidence. And we may at least initially feel some sense of wonder at the things that information technology 
can do. And so look for major leaps in technology and information to come online at this time. I'll be watching any of the AI companies. I'll be watching all of that. And we get into this summer flow of information during an election year. And so I'm thinking we might find all kinds of viral video clips or exposés or leaks or all of that. So Jupiter and Gemini is quite interesting looking at its history. It's timed inflation in recent American history. So during the Carter presidency in the late 1970s, Jupiter's entry into Gemini brought a second surge in inflation. Many commentators today are saying we might experience something similar. These aren't astrological people, but when you layer in this Jupiter and Gemini transit, it fits almost exactly with that inflationary tendency. Uh, you go to Jupiter and Gemini 2012 in, into 2013, this time surges in the price of Bitcoin. And so Jupiter and Gemini uh, coming here now in 2024, Bitcoin being known as an inflation hedge, especially with the Bitcoin halving happening in April, just before Jupiter ingresses into Gemini. I think we might have this perfect storm of inflationary pressure and a flight to safety to things like Bitcoin or other things that are determined um, inflation hedges like gold or silver. And this isn't financial advice in any way, shape or form, just astrological noting. Communication bridges the boundaries between human beings. And that is very much spoken to by the next big theme we've identified for 2024. Saturn and Neptune are already co-present in the sign of Pisces and they will remain so throughout 2024 but they'll start to get close to each other over the course of that year, making their closest approach on June the 29th, when they'll get to within about 10 degrees of each other. You know, Saturn and Neptune co-present in Pisces, it's fascinating because Saturn's limits will have to meet Neptune's boundlessness. So it's a very weird, almost paradoxical combination. Um, the synthesis between these two planets means that tangible and transcendent somehow blend here. And we might even be better able to anchor the dreams that we have, those transcendent imaginative states, uh, grounding those into reality with Saturn in Pisces. You know, Neptune is gonna provide a vision of unity and of the infinite potential and the greater oneness of all things. Neptune in Pisces has led to a boom in spirituality, mystical thinking, astrology, magical practices, and psychedelics, as well as mental health problems, addiction, and downright delusional thinking. I covered this subject on this channel in this video if you want to get more into that. In some sense, I'm glad that Saturn is now in Pisces because it'll bring some sense of reality and grounding to those areas, which is probably very much needed. At the same time, Saturn tends to work by applying pressure and forcing us to reckon with reality. And so the situation in the Piscean realms may feel worse before it improves. Saturn-Neptune times are often times of heightened skepticism, disillusionment, exhaustion, low morale. So it's gonna be interesting to see how this mood plays off of some of the Jupiter and Gemini themes we just talked about, especially because Jupiter will be squaring Saturn. So in this sense, it might be a blessing in disguise if skepticism is trending during this time, but it could also heighten the frustration that it's impossible to tell what's real anymore. You know, on a mundane level, I think it's gonna create more interaction with a sense of the global brain, the oneness of emotional real-time connection at some unseen or collective unconscious level. I mean, think about the cell phone, X Twitter, Instagram, it's just real-time, you're tapping and it's going into the brain and creating impulses where you're tapping in, connecting with everyone else in the world. So that's gonna get even more pronounced here in 2024, in 2025, and into 2026 as Saturn and Neptune get closer. Let's just look at the history. In recent time, there's only been a couple of years in the 19th century where Saturn and Neptune were co-president in Pisces. And so you saw during that period, both the United States and France issuing postage stamps for the first time. What is a postal service? It's a communication network, a structure that bridges the boundaries between human beings. This in mind, I'm very mindful of the new AI technologies that allow seamless translations between languages, including even altering video to make it look like we're speaking languages we don't know a word of. These apps are already here, but I think they'll start to make a big impact next year. To give you a taste of what this technology can really do, here's a little clip from our November forecast translated into Spanish using a new tool called HeyGen. And bear in mind that my actual Spanish is pretty 
terrible these days. No puedo endulzar las cosas demasiado. Noviembre presenta algunas configuraciones astrológicas difíciles. This is undoubtedly one of the more interesting and potentially transformational consequences of AI. In the online world, it will essentially level the playing field for speakers of every language in the world. The days of English's status as lingua franca may be numbered, and this may be the year when that becomes quite obvious. In the forecast I made for 2023 last year with Crypto Damas, we predicted that the theme of migration would be highlighted, and there's no doubt that this has really come to pass. Expect this issue to get even louder in 2024. We're likely to see migration in the news and more measures taken to impose control on it and regulate it, as well as attempts to control the discourse around it. So both Jupiter and Saturn are doing interesting things in the mutable signs in 2024. And so an interesting part of the story of the year is that they'll be making squares with each other. And squares are aspects of friction. In 2024, Jupiter and Saturn will be squaring each other by sign following Jupiter's ingress into Gemini in May. But they'll make exact squares twice in the year, first on August the 19th, and for the second time on December the 24th. And they'll make their third and final square in June of 2025. So this constitutes a key phase in the Jupiter-Saturn synodic cycle, which began in December of 2020. Remember what Jupiter and Saturn are. They're the two great planets in the ancient system, the two slowest moving planets and the two great drivers of change, which is why many astrologers, particularly in the Islamic tradition, would use Jupiter and Saturn conjunctions to build their whole predictive technologies upon. And so that they're in hard aspect, a square, what will happen here is what Richard Tarnas terms dynamic. And so it's an additional element of change induction for the year 2024, especially that both are immutable signs, signs of wearing two hats, of two states existing at once. And so I look for reality to change even more than it did in 2020 and extend those changes that came in 2020. Cycles tell stories, and so the waxing square will be a major moment in the story of this 20-year cycle. If we think back to what happened around the time of December 2020, well, this was the time that the first COVID jabs arrived. And in March 2021, when the two planets were still well within orb of conjunction, the WHO initiated talks on an international treaty around pandemic prevention and response. Expect important developments around these themes over the second half of the year, and particularly around the time of the exact squares. And so what we can do here simply is go back to everything that kicked off in 2020. COVID, Biden being elected, AI arises with Saturn in Aquarius. Uh, even in 2020, you have the beginnings of the AI that we're seeing now, the digital life, the Zoom life, as they say, uh, all arises in 2020 with the Saturn-Jupiter conjunction. And so 2024 brings a transition marker for those changes. You know, the theme is we're online and we're in a interconnected world like we've never been and technology is rapidly changing. It's a punctuation here with this waxing square. Jupiter-Saturn cycles have to do with governance. And ultimately, I think one major theme of this cycle is the implementation of an international technological and technocratic system ostensibly aimed at managing public health on a global scale. Squares are aspects of friction, so it's possible we may see new attempts at global governance that face resistance or controversies around the things that came into the world at the conjunction. Expect an avalanche of information around these subjects and get ready to be judicious about the information that you choose to believe. The pluto Quarian era will be well underway by this time, but Pluto will have a little more business to take care of back in Capricorn before we're fully plunged into this brave new world. On September the 1st, Pluto will retrograde back into Capricorn for one final two and a half month stint before it re-enters Aquarius on November the 19th, where it will remain until the middle of the 2040s. And so we get one last highly charged dose of Pluto in Capricorn, which is likely to bring up all the themes of institutional empowerment, corruption, hubris, and hypocrisy that we've seen building since 2008. September, October, and the first half of November are the Pluto and Capricorn season finale. And Pluto is at the anoretic 29th degree this entire time. So this will be significant. I think the main reason is that we'll have been settled into Pluto and Aquarius for over seven months. 
So we're finally thinking, hey, this is the Pluto and Aquarius world, and then bam, we're right back into one last dose of Pluto and Capricorn. So it might be jarring here. What was Pluto and Capricorn? What might we be revisiting here in September? Remember, it brought the market crash in 2008, just as Pluto entered Capricorn. We saw Occupy Wall Street during that time, the rise of Trump and Trumpism, the creation of Bitcoin, Brexit, the controversies around Jimmy Seville, the arrest of Jeff Epstein, the Me Too movement, the COVID crisis, and so much more on and on and on. So look for stories like these to potentially return one final time, the exposure of corruption in the system. The U.S. election here is in stark focus as well because election day happens with Pluto back into Capricorn. So I think this transit will bring back some kind of major shakeups. Uh, we saw the mechanisms and foundations of the structure of the system, that's Capricorn, being brought into question in the 2016 election, the 2020 election. Both of those elections included claims of fraud or of being stolen. Look for this election to include, sadly, I think, some of those same queries and some of that same controversy. This also kind of brings us out of the Neptune drama of the summer, where we're going to have Neptune parked at the 29th degree of Pisces all through May, June, July and August. With Neptune's presence in the last degree of Pisces, the end of the story of the Zodiac, there will likely be a dreamlike, perhaps even eschatological feel to this period. So instead of hot girl summer or sad boy autumn, we get soggy Neptune summer and Machiavellian Pluto autumn. It's a crucial election year during the final gasps of the US Pluto return, right? What could go wrong? You know, Neptune and Pluto will both be in the anoretic degree of their respective signs for just over one full day on 1, 2, and 3 September. Right as election season in America is ramping up, I think this will be a major moment where this destabilized anoretic placement of the two outer planets, Neptune and Pluto, might shake us up here because they're both so deep in their transitions, trying to birth themselves into new energy, but yet they have to come back to this final phase and complete part of the cycle that they have been engaged in. For the average person, these critical degrees are going to feel like a dramatic culmination of whatever this Neptune and Pisces, whatever this Pluto and Capricorn story has been about for you. Neptune at 29 degrees could either be the height or the breaking point of delusion, or it could be the maximization of your imagination. The dreamers are gonna be out in full force this summer. Could imagination and idealism bring us to some sort of tipping point? There may here be a sense of there being the end of an era. It may feel like a time in which the bonds to the past are definitively cut when the old world is revealed as a place to which we should not and indeed cannot return. So I know all of this sounds really dramatic, but there's also something really cool about the fall because this is when we start to see the beginnings of the Barbo basket starting to form with Uranus, Neptune and Pluto all starting to sextile each other. Neptune, Pluto and Uranus will be forming a minor grand trine. And so look for the egalitarian spirit of what Barbeau predicted to also begin emerging even more clearly here in 2024 as Neptune and Pluto are getting very close to that sextile again. And the volatility of this period will be compounded because it also includes the second of the year's two eclipse seasons. On September the 18th, we'll see a partial lunar eclipse at 25 degrees of Pisces, the first eclipse in that sign since 2017. And on October the 2nd, we'll see a solar eclipse at 10 degrees of Libra, the final eclipse in that sign until 2033. Eclipses can be thought of as like the opening of portals, when the truly new is able to come rushing into our lives and the old is flushed out. The Pisces eclipse uh, conjunct Neptune and square Jupiter seems like it's sort of tied into this theme of separating truth from illusion, which is probably going to be a pretty dominant thread in the astrology of the next couple of years. So Pisces eclipses that are close to Rahu, these cycles have been very creative. For example, the first iPhone was introduced by Steve Jobs during a Pisces eclipse cycle in the aughts. Remember that famous Steve Jobs announcement where he says, here's the iPhone, here it is. Who wants a stylus? You have to get them and put them away and you lose them, yuck. And that accelerated all kinds of creative visioning and appetites. Um, and that's the Rahu component being in Pisces here very, very soon. 
it's wanting to just get too much art. You know, think about something like Instagram that pretty much takes over the cell phone immediately where it's just too much, it's too crazy and intense. I think we might feel that here. Maybe with AI coming online and you can create anything you want just by thinking basically. And how might that lead us to get too excited or too overwhelmed or too uh, ambitious? You know, the other thing about this first eclipse in Pisces is that Saturn is also in Pisces. And so anytime you have Saturn co-present with an eclipse or square an eclipse, it can be rough energy. You know, Saturn is less interested in letting go and releasing into untethered intensities, whereas eclipses are just that. They want to cut us and break us free and accelerate us into new things. You know, you might want to brace yourself for a real feeling of what is this? Wow, this is changing too fast or it's too destabilizing or I'm too untethered with all of the dynamic changes that are happening. Then there's a final south node eclipse in Libra. This is a continuation of the unraveling of consensus and the unraveling of agreements, the release of people-pleasing tendencies, um, the release of the desire to be in accord with other people. And it will be closely conjunct the messenger of the gods, Mercury. I definitely think there could be some spicy words and sharp critiques landing with this one. Maybe uh, even an embrace of being disagreeable. And so I think by the end of this year, 2024, Libra placements and the cardinal axis may be seeing more than ever um, how their lives have been changed with this eclipse uh, cycle that started in 2023 and that has deepened here for all of 2024 with the lunar nodes in Aries and Libra. And the Libra solar eclipse in October comes just as the U.S. presidential election is ramping up in its final stages. And I'm thinking about legal challenges. Libra is the law. And when you have that lunar eclipse here, might there be lawsuits about votes and who's counting the votes? And, you know, if, uh, for example, certain candidates are excluded from debates or ballots, all of those things seem highly relevant. Now, we're almost at the end of our journey through this year now, but it has one last card to play. On December the 6th, Mars will station retrograde at six degrees of Leo. So the planet of action, assertiveness, and conflict will then retrograde into Cancer on January the 6th. So we've got a Mars retrograde in Leo and Cancer to close out the year and bring us into the next one. I think we're going to see a big drama of pride and defensiveness play out over those winter months. You know, Mars retrograde in the sign of the luminaries. We're going to be faced with this question of what are my defense mechanisms and how do they serve to A, protect my ego and B, protect me where I'm vulnerable. Mars and Leo brings this unmistakable surge of fiery energy. Mars, the planet of fire, Leo, the sign of fixed fire. But we're maybe using that to recognize the self or to assert our will and our power and selfhood into reality. You might think about a warrior king archetype here where we're fiercely guarding a kingdom and we're welcoming the public acclaim accordingly. I think that Mars stationing retrograde on 6 December 2024 in Leo will turn this vigor and this fiery power inward. So when we have Mars retrograde here, it's really a time to reassess the strategies that we're engaged in to secure our place in the world. And all of that gets called into question. On the other hand, could this also be a story of temporarily losing our courage and then finding it again because we need to summon the strength to protect something or someone we care deeply about? Is this a story of moving away from self-serving defensiveness and moving towards defense as an act of service? Expect to see bust-ups and beefs and competitions between celebrities, creatives, and leaders during this time. So we can see this as part of the overall landscape of late 2024, uh, right? You know, the Pluto and Capricorn finale, the unpopular opinion eclipses, and the lead up to this Mars retrograde, which seem like they could all be potentially interrelated somehow. It's hard to avoid noting that this comes in the wake of the presidential election in the US, and thus it does seem to promise intense competition and battles over leadership of who gets to be the sun. So the last time Mars stationed retrograde in Leo and then re-entered Cancer puts us back into the inflation years of the Carter administration. And it was during a time when Jupiter was also in Gemini, like in 2024. And so I think 2024, with the Mars retrograde cycle and with Jupiter in Gemini, brings us back to those Carter years. And we might, with this Mars retrograde, be tasked again with changing our identities and our actions as the economic system continues to be a little bit unstable with some inflation potentially returning. So that's it for this annual forecast. We hope it's given you a good idea of what the year will hold for you 
and for the wider world. These general forecasts are useful as guides, but they can only tell you so much as an individual. All three of us are available for year ahead readings in which we'll be able to tell you in much more detail what these big transits will mean for you personally. If you're curious to see what 2024 has in store for you individually, I am currently starting to book year ahead readings for January. You might also be watching this later in the year when some of these things that we're talking about are already happening, uh, which is okay because I also offer general consultations um, for when you have a situation and you just want to make sense of it. I also offer birth chart readings, year ahead forecasts, student sessions, and progress moon histories year round. So January is definitely not the only time uh, that it makes sense to get a reading. So I hope you all have a wonderful 2024 and um, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of each other as we do the more nitty gritty monthly forecasts. And don't forget to check out SJ's YouTube channel. He's also available for bookings at sjanderson144.com. And I am too. Head to danwaitsastrology.com and maybe taking some time off consultations to focus on some other projects quite soon. So if you've been meaning to book with me, then now's the time. And as you'll have seen, a huge theme of this year is Pluto in Aquarius. If you're curious to learn more about what it will have in store for the world, then I suggest you watch this video in which SJ and I analyzed its first stint in that sign in early 2023 and made some predictions about what it's likely to signify in the world in the coming years. Thanks so much and see you next time.